Hello, my wonderful viewers, and welcome to another episode of Betty Adams Overanalyzes. Today, we are going to take a look at running themes in storytelling, themes that appear again and again in books, themes that don't appear that often. And we are going to take a look at Kaiju number eight and the Lord of the Rings and the the one that's the long one that starts with an S that we all want to claim we've read in full, but most of us haven't actually read in full. So I have technically read it cover to cover, but I, I haven't retained a lot of the details, so I'm not going to say I read it, read it. But the sim... sim, sim, sim <laughs> okay, you know, the one that's not The Hobbit, not The Lord of the Rings. The one with all of the deep lore. So anyway, how do these two tie in? Well, if you listen to my videos a lot, you know that I've spotted a lot of thematic consistency between J.R.R. Tolkien's work and Matsumoto's work. You have concepts of kindness and compassion and those small acts of day-to-day -day life being the driving forces. You have concepts like people who settled down, thought they were past the age of adventure, thought their life was over, and then find that their life is just beginning. You have themes of not doing anything until you're in your mid-30s. And you have themes of duty and responsibility. And some of these are, of course, just universal themes that show up in any good story where you have conflict and character growth. But there are, again, some themes that are not universal that show up in both Kaiju Number 8 and The Lord of the Rings. And that has led me to a kind of theory video. And this will be in part a theory video about kaiju number eight in part uh, literary analysis so i'm not too sure about this theory I, we don't have enough evidence to even call it a real theory yet it's just uh, some thematic things I've noticed. You may have watched my video about the similarities and differences between Kaiju's number eight and number nine, and how there are weird. Kaiju number nine is a weird, dark mirror of Kaiju number eight, even though Kaiju number eight is the physically darker one. You have Kaiju number eight that is bone and hard muscle and electricity and constant movement and tautness, and you have Kaiju number nine that's soft and flabby and rotting tissue and decaying matter. And kaiju number nine, who can ironically revivify things. And kaiju number eight, who seems to be able to suppress that regeneration. So they're equals and opposites. But I went into that into great detail in that video and in the follow-up video that I did in response to a comment left on that video by, an, uh, by, a, by a, someone who watches my YouTube videos. Now, I was kind of discussing this with uh, my, go my good friend Dan Exclaims on one of our joint video discuss discussion videos, and I got to talking about this and I articulated something that's been kind of in the back of my mind for a while now. So let's start with the one that starts with an S, the one that comes before the Lord of the Rings, the backstory to the Lord of the Rings, the deep lore. So you have, in the Lord of the Rings, you have the Dark Lord Saruman, and you have Gandalf. And on the surface level, these seem to be two very different entities. One's powerful and massive and moves armies. And one's just kind of a very almost comical wizened old man who wanders around the countryside selling fireworks and sharing the wisdom of his age with folks younger than he is. Namely, that adventure doesn't end when you pass 50. I mean, your life is only beginning. Gandalf lives the example of that, and he encourages other people to, uh, I, if that's what you can call basically kidnapping Bilbo and coercing him into uh, to go poke a dragon with a stick. But anyway, you have Gandalf and you have Saruman. On the surface level, to the eyes of the Hobbit, to our point of view characters, they're vastly different. But not only are Gandalf and Saruman the same species, they're essentially the same generation. They're cohorts, they're mates. They are the Maiar, or they are, they were Maiar in Saruman's case, and they serve the Valar, the High Angels. The Valar are essentially what the Greek pantheon was in terms of power. They can and will have relationships with mortal beings that produce offspring. They are very angelic, they are very spiritual, they are immortal. They live in the undying lands. Many of them existed before time itself existed. 
And they have helpers, less, lesser creatures that serve them called the Maiar. Gandalf was one of these Maiar, as was Saruman originally. And they both served their respective Valar. Gandalf is the embodiment of hope and love and putting others' needs above your own, whereas Saruman became the embodiment of ambition and prioritizing your own goals, not only above the good of other individuals, but over, even over your ultimate own good, letting your ambition for power drive you into the ground. Now, you have here Saruman. You know what? I was going to edit that out, but I'm going to leave it in. You have here Sauron. I mean, the, making that mistake is itself a joke in the fandom, so I'll leave that in. Sauron going through the history of Middle-earth, cropping up in various different places, manifesting with different bodies even at times, manifesting minions constantly in one shape or another, where not even the wisest of the wise, not even Gandalf, who was a contemporary of his, easily an equal of his in terms of raw power, not even Gandalf the wise could always tell when it was him. Sometimes it took Gandalf centuries to figure out when Saruman when Sauron was doing something s sneaky and how and how to counter it. So it looks on the surface as if Sauron has the more power, but in the end we know that it was Sauron who was defeated, primarily due to his own actions, and Gandalf who ended up succeeding and returning to the Undying Lands, returning to his immortality where he could be with his elder brothers and sisters and he could basically be at peace doing what he really wanted to do. In contrast to Sauron, Gandalf has, as far as we know, only ever had the one mortal body. He came into this world a wizened old man and he just wandered, wandering around here and there making friends, making allies, making enemies, sticking his nose in places that he wasn't always wanted, doing what good he can, could, on a very small scale. Meanwhile, Sauron is out there gathering armies, ruling nations, rising cultures and religions, and changing the world in these massive, impressive ways. Whereas Gandalf's out there wandering around, having fun and doing his good deed of the day. Gandalf befriends the hobbits. Gandalf maintains his relationship with Radagast the Brown. Gandalf makes sure that he knows who's who in the chieftains of the Dúnedain, who would eventually produce Aragorn, the king who would be vital in bringing about the downfall of Sauron. Gandalf tries to do what he can to heal, heal the rift between the dwarves and the elves. G uh, but again, Gandalf's not forcing anybody. Gandalf's not establishing a seat of power for himself. Gandalf doesn't even establish a real one home for himself. He lives on the charity of his friends, bouncing around between Rivendell and the Shire, and for all looks of it, just existing. And in the end, their two different tactics leads to two different results. Sauron, with his constant creating and warping of creation and rising of power, extends himself, and every time he loses power, he lo lost the ring to the battle with his seal door, and he lost significant chunks of his power every time he was defeated by the combined might of elves, men, and dwarves. But in the end, it's these very victories, these expendings of his energy that lead to his downfall and his ultimate destruction. And it's those wanderings, befriending people, making connections. That's what ultimately leads to Gandalf's success, even when the, the, the wise, kind, and good of his fellows considered him foolish for his behavior, or at least less proactive than they thought he should be. So that's the summary of Gandalf and Sauron, and how they compare and contrast. But to better segue into my comparison to Kaiju number eight, I want to bring up one of the main things that Gandalf did. He was a keeper of hope and encouragement. He bore the sacred ring that in general the fandom believes to be a 
magical token of the spirit of encouragement. And that was one of Gandalf's main roles. He came into the world to give courage, to get people through the hard times. Sauron's out there actively trying to destroy. He's the Dark Lord, the Doombringer. So it's thematically different, but Sauron never seems to have the ability to discourage people other than through, you know, the traditional means. Uh, Gandalf is special that way. He has on his hand, on his finger, the ability to give hope, give strength, give courage. Now, what does any of this have to do with a manga that just started being published in 2020? Well, we'll get there. In this manga, you have the main character, Kafka, his symbiote that has replaced or wrapped around his heart. And between them, you have the manifestation of their symbiosis, Kaiju number eight. Now, Kaiju number eight stands in stark contrast to Kaiju number nine. Kai and I've gone over that in great detail in other videos, but essentially Kaiju number nine is a white pasty fungus that has no regard for human life, is constantly causing discouragement and terror and fear, and is studying the world for specifically for some goal of his own, probably to benefit either himself singularly or Kaiju in general. Kaiju number eight is black and shiny and tight and has lots of bone. Anything that's white on him is bone, so sterile. And Kaiju number eight seems to have the power to degenerate Kaiju flesh as opposed to Kaiju number nine's re Kaiju regeneration powers. They are opposites in every sense of the word. Ka and more importantly, Kaiju number eight as Kafka has the power to bring hope, to bring courage, to bring that kind of peace that a trained soldier gets in the battlefield when he knows that somebody has his back. And this latest chapter, chapter 47, just really illustrates that. It shows that as Kafka accepts the monster within and internalizes it and learns to control it, he is able to use that power that he has in his human form in his transformed form as kaiju number eight to smile to bring courage and strength to the people around him primarily in this sense to kikoru but knowing that he transformed has probably encouraged the entire first division giving giving them that boost that that militaries get when they know that the cavalry's on the way out to the real comparison with sauron and Gandalf. Now, again, Gandalf and Sauron were both the same kind of being, something from beyond this world, something bigger than just the human forms that they manifested. And they manifested in two very different ways. Saruman always seeking power to control things, to change the world to his will. Gandalf making individual connections with people and hoping to guide these people to a better state of being through his example and through his wisdom. Now we have Kaiju number eight and Kaiju number nine. It has become increasingly obvious that Kaiju number nine is not these individual bodies. There are I've done multiple videos on this, but kaiju number eight appears to be a fungal type kaiju. And in the real world, fungus exists, the kind of for mushroom that you see in the ground, that's not the fungus. That is a single reproductive body, something to be temporarily used to reproduce to achieve a goal. The real fungus exists underground as a network of fibers. You can't see I'm making a very descriptive gesture with my hands here as I'm describing this. The largest organism on the planet is called Pando. It's not a fungus, but it's a, it's a, it's a colony of aspen trees that is just giant. It's actually one giant tree with many, many different trunks because they're, they, they all grow up from the roots. Not really relevant, but the second largest or known organism in the world is a fungus that lives somewhere under New England. This fungus is larger than, mo than, than those New England states. It stretches out underneath them as a network of fibers and it sends up thousands of individual bodies, fruiting bodies, mushrooms, but the fungus itself maintains that massive mass and that otherworldliness, that otherness, by existing underground as a network of fibers. If you dug into the ground anywhere in this state, you wouldn't find it. You'd find dirt, you'd find rocks, and if you looked in with a, with a microscope, you might find a few individual fibers. You haven't killed the fungus, you haven't even really disturbed it. As soon as you drop the dirt back down, the fibers will regrow back into 
in the main body. So that is what it, that is what it seems that the series is establishing kaiju number nine as. Kai, whatever is producing these individual bodies that we have been calling kaiju number nine is the Sauron, is this great being that from a human perspective at least, I went into another video on that, is the big bad, is evil, is trying to kill us. So let's not call him evil, let's call him a, an antagonist. Kai, the being that is producing these kaiju number nine bodies, the kaiju Sauron, is acting in its own interests. It has its own goal. It has its own power. And it's using that power, apparently from what kaiju number nine is saying, for the good of kaiju. Now this might be for its own good only, but it does seem to be acting more from a point of pragmatism than of evil. It's not, me. I'm going to kill all the humans. It's, Dude, I need resources. The humans aren't the defense forces in the way of my getting resources. I need to know how to deal with the defense force. So, but again, it appears that Kaiju number nine comes into our world, sends out creatures that are completely disrespectful of human life and human property. And its intention was to cause as much damage as possible when Kaiju number nine was planning on releasing that giant type fungus Kaiju and the defense force intervened. So this could, this could be the same creature between behind Kaiju number 10. We don't know yet. It could be the same creature behind a lot of these different individual uh, Kaiju, but we don't know that yet. Again, there's not really enough data to support this theory. It's not even a theory at this point. I'm just noting thematic similarities here. You have effectively in the in the fibers in the ground of this super kaiju, a kaiju that is essentially thematically the same as Sauron. That would make kaiju number eight our Gandalf. And think about it this way. If there is another creature, another kaiju type intelligence of equal power and origin of similar origin to whatever is causing these kaiju number nine bodies, but it is either neutral or benign or even more than benign, beneficent, how would it reach out and communicate with humans who know only to fear and fight kaiju because that's all the kaiju they've seen. Perhaps by reaching out and communicating. Now, you might say that crawling into somebody's mouth, taking over their body, isn't very beneficent. It's downright evil, in fact. But that is from the perspective of an individual mammalian organism that whose very being, whose essence, whose identity is in danger if something takes over your body. From the perspective of a being that does not have one body, from the perspective of a being that might see each individual human as only a reproductive body of the human race as a whole, maybe not so evil, maybe just a an unavoidable inconvenience. So look what I'm looking at is not kaiju number eight itself. Kaiju number eight is the interaction of the little guy and Kafka. What I'm looking at is the father or the progenitor of the little guy, that little dragonfly kaiju that crawled into Kafka at the beginning. So I'm looking for a beneficent presence behind that little kaiju, something that sent that little kaiju, sent it into the world to communicate with humans. That would explain why it chose Kafka. Kafka the, if we are looking at this presence behind Kaiju number eight as Gandalf, the embodiment of compassion and true love and representing hope, Kafka made the perfect host. That would answer why Kafka, why this random dude whose only claim to fame is that he's one of, one of Mina's old friends. Well, if a beneficent force, a force that was trying to bring peace between human and kaiju, a force that was trying to establish communications with kaiju, what would it be looking for? An older head, a wiser head, an old man who'd had a few years on his life, someone with compassion, someone who can inspire courage, someone like Kafka, someone who genuinely cares for others as Kafka has proved that he does time and time again. A lot of the reviewers who analyze this series have talked about the little, the little bug kaiju said, I found you. And it seemed to have chosen Kafka after he was seen taking, t A, 
taking care of Reno, caring for him in the active sense, making sure that he had plenty to eat, making sure that his day was as pleasant as possible, and then actively jumping in and showing physical courage when he saved Reno's life. That maybe Kafka's behavior towards Reno was the driving force that caused this, the little dragonfly kaiju to choose Kafka as its host. And again, if you are looking for that mirror of the power behind kaiju number nine, kaiju number eight is a mirror of kaiju number nine. There is a power behind kaiju number nine. So if we look at kaiju number eight as a mirror of kaiju number nine, there should be a beneficent power behind kaiju number eight. And if you're looking for that, then it may makes sense that this beneficent power chose Kafka as his representative in the same way that it makes sense that Gandalf chose Frodo and Bilbo as his representative. He chose these sturdy, kind, loving, peaceable hobbits. And this unknown entity that we are postulating to be behind Kaiju number eight, it chose a sturdy, kind, loving, not too flashy, not too showy, but showing both practical and functional compassion and and enough physical courage to get the job done not courage to the point of stupidity not compassion to the point of not being able to fight that nice hobbitish balance as i said this theory has been developing in the back of my head for a while now and i've actually given these two super kaiju the one that i that we have pretty decent evidence for behind kaiju number nine and the one that i'm just postulating to be behind kaiju number eight because kaiju number eight is such a mirror of kaiju number nine and ultimately that's all it boils down to i have no existence for the i have no evidence for the existence of two of these beings only the one behind kaiju number nine but i do have names for them they're, they're based on some native american lore that i learned working for the national parks at crater lake national park and the first being, the one behind Kaiju number nine that we have pretty evidence for, I named after the somewhat antagonistic supernatural being named Lao. And the one that was behind Kaiju number eight, I've named after the more human friendly supernatural being Skell. So in the local mythos, there were a, there was a small pantheon of definitely interdimensional characters they were not weren't probably weren't even at the power level of the greek pantheon but they are kind of in that range they were associated with various mountains mount mazama was associated with lao the underworld spirit and uh, the upper world spirit was skell and depending on which tribe you talk to you get different stories but and the stories have gotten mixed up over time as they've as they've been passed down orally but basically lao was an underworld spirit who while not actively evil or antagonistic i mean we're not talking about a demon here he's just a supernatural being who was entirely self-centered and didn't care if his temper tantrums messed up the local population whereas skell actually had a hand in crafting humanity not only giving them life but giving them culture and Skell was more active in the world and like I said depending on which story you listen to Skell either came to blows with Lao or another another one in the local pantheon to protect humanity because of that I've I've sort of named the creature be the being behind number nine as Lao the underworld creature and the creature behind number eight is Skell. The symbology actually works there because we know that Kaiju number nine has the power to manipulate things underground. He said as much when he was describing how he'd put the reproductive organs in the giant fungal Kaiju from Kafka's first real battle. Kaiju number nine summoned the ants from underground. Kaiju number nine seems to get around through the ground. Very, very ground associated Kaiju number nine. So he, he, the creature behind him that generates him gets the name Lao, whereas Skell, being the sky spirit, is associated with that flying dragon type kaiju, flight so being associated with the sky. And there was just some imagery, I know, especially of kaiju number eight jumping out of the hospital window against the full moon and a bright night sky. And kaiju number eight and Kafka both have a lot of sky based imagery behind them in the manga. So, yeah, so I'm pretty happy with the creature that we are pretty sure exists being named Lao 
and the creature that may or may not exist, depending on how much Kaiju number eight actually is a mirror of Kaiju number nine, Skell. So I see Skell being as the father of or progenitor of that little dragonfly Kaiju, and Skell having sent the dragonfly Kaiju as one individual to make contact with a human individual to facilitate communication between the kaiju and the humans, hopefully to be able to bring about a significant peace between kaiju and humans. But again, this is all barely even theory status right now. I would not have done this video had not Dan exclaims put the idea in my head. Meanwhile, Dan's going to sit around and wait until we're sure of a lot more stuff before he does any of his theory videos. But I can't blame him. I would have made this video eventually. But you're getting it now. You're being introduced to Lau and Skell, the Gandalf and Sauron of the Kaiju number no. 8 world. Or I should have said that the other way around. Lau and Skell, the Sauron and the Gandalf of the Kaiju number no. 8 world. And you can thank Dan Exclaims for that. So go, go, go over and mock him on his channel for me. His videos are worth the watch. So there is my thoughts on the strange thematic similarities between Kaiju number no. 8 and the backstory to the Lord of the Rings. You have one being from beyond that's more than a human, that's more than an individual, wrecking the world for unknown purposes that seem perfectly valid to him. And you have a potential for another being to artistically mirror him, going about making friends, establishing connections in an awkward way that is nowhere near Gandalf's level of subtlety and compassion. But again, we are talking about thematic parallels, not exact copying or even plagiarism here. So what do you think? Does Skell exist? Do, do, I suppose I should ask you, do you think Lau exists? Because Lau, the creature that is spawning all these Kaiju number nine bodies, I'm pretty confident that it exists. There's something underground. I don't think it would matter if every single Kaiju number nine body was completely destroyed down to the core. We would just see another, another Kaiju number nine body pop up the next day. I'm pretty sure that Lau exists. But do you think that Skell exists? Is there a greater intelligence behind or is Another theory, of course, is just that the little guy, the little dragonfly kaiju, was just a glitch, a one of Lao's plans that went wrong. And so Lao intended to make it to take over a human body completely, but it came out a blank slate and instead it's just merging and with Kafka in a true symbiosis. But that's another theory. My The current concept of this video is that Skell is the father of the little dragonfly kaiju and he sent the little dragonfly kaiju to find a friend who they could talk to, to make friends, to find a compassionate, courageous, intelligent person who could help bring peace between human and kaiju. So, those are my two cents on the matter. If you like what you hear on my channel, you can go check out my book to get a lot more of my brain for my book, Humans Are Weird. We took a vote, available on Indiegogo through October 2021. And, or you can check out the predecessor, Humans Are Weird, I Have the Data, available wherever books are sold. So, peace out, my wonderful viewers. Humans Are Weird, We Took a Vote. Available on Indiegogo for the month of October 2020 and available for in demand through, through November. Humans are weird. We took a vote. Monty Python meets Star Trek in the second book of Human Absurdity, a short story collection that will have you chuckling for years to come. Humans are weird. We took a vote. Available on Indiegogo. Go and get your copy now.